Okay. You might not want to start quite so soon. We have a lot of dead time at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, and let's see if you can pause. Pause. Yeah, but we don't forget. Time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this would be the first seminar of this semester, and uh, we are glad to have uh, David, uh, the Hillster. If I, okay, all right, cool, yeah. Glad I didn't make the made a mistake. Uh, so yeah, so I guess uh, Amy will 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 introduce the speaker. So now I pass the mic to Amy. Okay, thank you, Zhang Kaizhan. And it is my pleasure to introduce David DeHilster. He has more than 35 years experience in practical applications and natural language processing, and is the co-author of the computer language NLP++. He has a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and a Master's in Linguistics from The Ohio State University. So he also has uh, experience in several industrial locations and has worked for several startup companies, including Text Analysis International, where he and his colleague Amnon Myers developed NLP++ and visual text. He currently works at the Supercomputing Development Group at LexisNexis in Boca Raton, where he's integrating NLP++ into HPCC systems. Please welcome David DeHilster. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank people before I start because a lot of times we get into questions and I do wanna thank Dr. Uh, Amy Apon for setting up this lecture and supporting students interested in our open source technologies at HPC Systems. Clemson University, for, of course, for uh, hosting these kinds of talks. I wanna thank all my grant and intern students uh, who uh, have been doing amazing work with their contributions to the open source uh, projects. LexisNexis and the HPC Systems Group, who took me in, guiding me on the open source projects and supporting the NLP effort. Lorraine Chapman, Trish, Trish McCall, and Hugo uh, Watanuki for supporting this, this year's NLP intern projects uh, for partnerships in universities. And Elmo Meyer, my best friend, also architect and conceptual grammar and co-architect of the language NLP++, and for taking that uh, all uh, open source. So my name is David Hilser. I work uh, six years. I've worked six years in the supercomputing group at LexisNexis uh, Risk Solutions. I do have over 35 years of practical NLP experience. Uh, currently working on an NLP++ plugin bundle for HPC systems, and I'm also co-author of the computer language NLP++ and creator of Visual Text. The uh, for those who are not familiar with the high performance computing cluster. That's what I'm part of this group. It's a supercomputer. Oops, it's going on its own here. Um, Got to watch out. Uh, there's, it takes in big data, whether it's structured or unstructured. Uh, we use an ECL language, uh, enterprise com computing language, to write the programs for the supercomputer. It puts the data into uh, a data refinery called Thor. And Roxy a cluster is a data delivery system. And we do have visualization uh, a package along with that. There are many, many plugins that go along with this. I'm not going to go in over any of these really, just to show you this is a very mature system. I think it celebrated its 10th year anniversary in open source and 20 years as a couple of years ago of the technology. Um, there is a lot of uh, machine learning libraries. Roger Dev, a colleague of mine, has put uh, in the last few years, put in a lot of work putting a lot of the machine learning libraries in. And now, uh, thanks to uh, some work I've been doing, and uh, we are now have an NLP++ plugin, version one available right now uh, with HPC systems. So today I'm gonna to be talking about uh, intelligent programming. Uh, what is intelligence? Why machine learning is not? Um, and why NLP++ is? If you look back, you're gonna, you, if those of you know the Turing test, well, the Turing test was named after Alan Turing. And it was first called the imitation game, which you can get an idea, is it really intelligence? And the idea was to test the machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from uh, that of a human. And it was interesting, of course, the test was really a natural language test where you would sit at a teletype and you would get questions and answers, et cetera. So it was already based 
language, language and intelligence were already there. Now, you may have heard this a couple uh, months ago that uh, one of the Google scientists turned off the uh, AI because it became sentient. Well, that person no longer works there because the truth of the matter is that it's, it's based on an AI technology called Lambda or language model for dialogue applications. It responds to written prompts by finding patterns and predicting sequences of words from large swaths of text. And that result, and the results can be disturbing. Why is that? If you ever sat down and, and, and interacted with this, you, you really think there's another human on the other side. <clears throat> but of course it says it's simply, uh, it is simply an immense parroting memory that can feign intelligence using tricks. So it does pass the Turing test, but I would, I, I myself do not call this an intelligent program. I'm now going to oversimplify natural language processing. I look at it from the practical side, and this is what I kind of see. These are not dates that are set in stone. A lot of this stuff started at the times I talk about, but this gives me, from a person who's been in it for a long time, this is the kind of way I see it. Uh, in 1940, the first AI was natural language processing for translation. They figured if I can break codes for Russia, Rus uh, uh, Russian codes or German codes, I can break the code for Russian into English, meaning I could translate it. They soon found out that wasn't true. We did talk about the Turing machine kind of setting up an idea of what intelligent programming was. Noam Chomsky in 1960 came along and he proposed, uh, basically made modern linguistics what it is today and computational linguistics. Eliza in the Blocks world from MIT, Terry Winograd is really what I consider to be the first intelligent program. And 1980, you saw, in the 1980s, you saw many uh, people, including us, uh, trying to use the linguistic rules by Chomsky using computers. And of course, we had languages like Prolog, which you didn't even have to write algorithms. You just put in grammars and it supposedly would be able to parse the uh, language, but we got into combinatoric problems. Well, other people did. Um, machine learning really started in the 1990s and has gone up to what it is today. Translation really started in the 2000s. Again, more machine learning, neural networks kind of stuff, a lot of training. We got the speech. So through the 2000s, translation and speech and NLP got really good. Um, and I'm claiming now that we're going to be entering a new phase of intelligent programs. And part of the reason is the programming language NLP++. Machine learning really isn't intelligence. It's really more of an empty intelligence where we can uh, get it to uh, develop sophisticated pattern matching uh, that uh, must be trained. Uh, they are good at visual, visual classification, which of course is very hard in logical programming. So that's one of the, if you notice the area that it does uh, uh, spectacularly a lot of times is in the vision area. Um, and they are not good at language and math kind of funny because neither is the human brain. Um, and it's, it cannot learn meaning on its own. And if you saw the movie, if you date yourself like me being older, short, short circuit, there's this number five in this uh, famous uh, uh, scene in the movie where he's <laughs> reading this paper, this book and just more input, more input, need more input. Well, the only way that can happen is, in my, I claim, is that he had to have humans build into him world knowledge and linguistic knowledge. And it doesn't happen on its own. So I, I sort of have this love-hate relationship with machine learning because it's out there and people say it's solved everything. And, and in my area, it has solved very, not a whole lot. So I saw this, I couldn't resist. I don't know if anybody's seen this, but it makes your head hurt. Just concentrate on one of the dog spaces and move over and you see them up and, and you'll see why your brain, your neural network will start fuming. And I don't usually stay on this, but it was sort of my uh, little uh, fun, fun, uh, uh, not retribution, but sort of fun getting at all, seeing all this A on TV and IBM, we've got big, you know, all that stuff. So I, I thought I'd throw this in. Let's get back to, why I say machine learning can't learn meaning. Well, if you look at hieroglyphics, it's 5,000 years old. Human beings spent 1,500 years trying to decipher it. Now, I would consider a human being today to be the best learning neural network machine learning uh, tool we have, and yet it could get nothing out of it. In fact, it wasn't until 1799 when the Rosetta Stone came along and had Sanskrit and I don't remember the other uh, language, but once they saw that and could compare it, they finally, by 1822, could decipher it. Well, why is that? It's because today's orthographic systems are arbitrary. Orthographic and linguistics means writing systems. 
Writing symbols started out as pictographs, but today they're arbitrary. Um, they must be learned, they must be memorized, and we must give them to computers. Well, you say, no, no, Dave, there is text vectors. And, and I got a lecture, I, one of the first lectures I saw on text vectors is computers can find meaning. Well, what they can find are statistical word uh, distances in that you can see similar things like walking, it, the, the distance to walked is the same as swimming to swam. Um, and we put that meaning on it. The, the computer has no idea what it is. All they have are these distances between uh, words. Whereas if you look at the way humans and the way we learn things is we learn a language by looking at uh, relating physical and conceptual things to words or symbols. Here's the Maui language um, for the farm. And when you're learning this, uh, it's a Polynesian language. You look at the egg and you have a, a word. It's written a certain way. You say it a certain way. That's the way you learn. Is it, does it have to do with the egg? There are folk etymologies where people want to say all kinds of things about kinds of words, but in general, it's pretty much considered to be completely arbitrary. So um, I'm going to put my face on the line and say, this is not, we, we don't want to look at a Turing test. We want to look at an intelligent test. I thought a lot about this. What does that mean? To, mean what it, to me, what it means is humans must be shown that, the, that a computer has understood text in the same way as a, a human understands it. Now, you can go think, well, no, computers do things in a different way. No, I am saying that this is what we consider to be intelligent. Every robot we see on TV, every robot we see in the movies, this is how we would judge it. And that, that's the way we can. And actually, I'll talk about why you can do that today. This involves more than text interactions. It involves linguistic knowledge, memory, and world knowledge. So this is the purpose of language. This is why I've been into this so much, because it's so interesting. Because I have something in my brain. I spit out these sounds, which you now can parse and know, parse into words. You know, know the grammar of English and all the world around us and all the things that we know. And my goal is that I have some idea in my brain. I'm going to spit out this, this uh, data to you. You're going to interpret it and hopefully recreate that in your brain. You could be a doctor looking at a uh, radiology report, uh, radi uh, uh, um, MRI, and you're dictating what you see in it. The idea there is he's trying to describe something that he wants to recreate in your brain. That's the whole idea. So if we want to do things that are intelligent or computers that are intelligent, we should be doing the same kind of thing. So intelligent, I claim, requires language. Intelligent and language have evolved over thousands of years. Put yourself on a, on a desert island without anything we know of, including language. You're not going to come up with a, a high level of a language at all. In fact, children who have been isolated linguist, linguistically can barely speak. Some of them can't. And even when they do learn, it's very stilted. So language and intelligence have been evolving for thousands and thousands of years. The languages we speak today are very complicated compared to the way they were early on. Knowledge and language are almost and intelligence are almost inseparable. Uh, today's world, think of today's world, what we have. Yes, you could have artisans tell you how, you know, show you how to do things, and we could possibly do a society like that. But all of these electronics, all these things we have, can we do, could we have done that without language? I highly doubt it. So intelligence, in my opinion, requires understanding language and the world it represents. Human language. It takes four to 14 years before we linguists say that they are uh, native speakers of that language. Four years, what language, anybody guess what, what language takes the least amount of time to learn before you're considered an adult language speaker? Anybody? Nobody wants to say. English. So if you're a person who's not a native English speaker and you have a friend who's a foreigner who says English is real hard, they're lying to you. <laughs> but 14 years. Hmm. I bet some people in here speak a language that I think that's their language. Actually, it's Finnish. Uh, Finnish, will, I'll tell you what's so hard about Finnish. They have long and short consonants and vowels. So how long you hold on to a consonant like bitta or bitta or bitta or bitta, I can't do it. Uh, that's, but we have to learn it. If you take, you have to see the Lord of the Flies behind there in that picture. Well, if you put kids on a deserted island to learn a language, they're not going to come off with, with much more than grunts and, and maybe gestures. They're not going to come up with the full language. They're not going to come off the island saying, you know why I think the Higgs boson is a, is a joke? 
they're not going to come off saying that. Computers must be taught language as well. This idea that we can build these machines and they're going to learn it. The first intelligent program, in my opinion, is SureGlue from Blocks World, from Terry Windegrad from MIT. And it's basically a Blocks World where it has everything you know about it. It's blocks. There's a place you can put a box in colors and shapes. It knew, knows everything about it. You could ask any. This was back in 68 to 72. They had graphics to do this. They had uh, natural language processing going on with the linguistic world. And it could explain itself. You could ask it why it did something. And you could ask it why it did that until it undid something where it says that, you know, you asked me to. So the idea is if you have a computer that knows everything about the world, it's going to be what I consider to be intelligent. Now, this was really hard. This took literally about a month and a half. How I was looking up, what is it, what's the difference between traditional programming and, and intel, programming intelligent uh, computer programs? And I looked them up on Google and it was very, very hard to find something that was even it describes what programming is. What is programming? So I had to think about in comparison with intelligent programming, I said, okay, you have all these languages there behind it. Many of us, almost every pro programmer knows maybe even a couple dozen. When you think, think about what you're gonna do in program, you think about it in that programming language. You think like a computer. If you have TypeScript, you think like TypeScript. You think uh, C++, you think like C++. SQL, Java, Python. So that I came up with like a computer. Well, intelligent programming is thinking like a human. And in fact, when you get to NLP++, which I claim is the first programming language for intelligent programming, the biggest problem I'm seeing my interns uh, have is they think about the language and not how people do it. So they get caught up in the code of NLP++ and they go, what are you doing? And they'll say, well, I'm making a loop here. I said, what's a person doing? And then they step back and they go, oh, okay. And then they go back to the knowledge base and look at that. So it's for the first time in computer science, I'm claiming we have a computer programming language that can write intelligent programs. It's composed of NLP++, conceptual grammar, which is a knowledge base, and visual text, which is a programming uh, uh, IDE. It's open source technology, works on all three platforms, and anything thinkable. No, I didn't come up with that. Actually, when we uh, started this, we had a startup that 20 years ago that put this together. One of the people we hired, I, uh, he came up to me and said, you know, Dave, after working on this, I got a great uh, tour that explained NLP++. And I go, what's that? He goes, anything thinkable. I go, wow, that's pretty amazing. So, and uh, as of two, December 8, 2018, it was proprietary, it became open source on GitHub. And really it's made up of three pieces, NLP++ programming language, conceptual grammar, which is really built in. Uh, but it's also separate in files and the visual text IDE, which is really super important. Really, I think it was one of the first times that uh, an IDE is an essential part of programming. Um, and so NLP, what makes it unique? It allows for you to concentrate on intelligent tasks and not on programming. If you were to try to do something like read the radiology text and break it up, you may, uh, and you had to do it only in one language, which language would you pick? <laughs> None of them. Maybe Python, but again, you can't use other packages. You would only use that language. So it's very unique in that sense. So it, it automatically breaks down text into tokens, handles all texts, including Unicode. If you can see over here, we've got some syntactic rules that have uh, Chinese characters, and I even have an emoji. Uh, it's just a kind of a joke here, but uh, you can write you can write syntactic rules uh, with emojis. Um, which comes in very handy because we have a project in Portuguese right now. I'm working with a guy from a uh, university on uh, uh, sentiment. It has sophisticated rule and functions to construct syntactic trees from text. Highly, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about this. Highly inter interconnected between text and knowledge. That's so important. That is so important. There's a, there's a connection between the text and the knowledge in the brain, we call it, I call it kind of the brain, but we call it conceptual grammar. And of course it has a built-in knowledge base. Knowledge base can be built on the fly while processing tests. The existing or knowledge that you're building up as you read the test can be used in the rest, rest of the text you're reading. And the knowledge hierarchy, it's a knowledge hierarchy, but it can be tangled, meaning you can represent all of human knowledge in this system if you had enough time and space. And of course the highly interconnected visual visual IDE is almost impossible to develop 
NLP++ or analyzers without the IDE that we have. I'm going to give you a real life example. This, if you want to, you can go to H see down here with that red arrow down here. You can go to hpcc.visualtext.org, write it down. You'll be able to see everything we're doing with HPCC uh, systems and visual text. You'll also see a video of this demo. Uh, I spent about two weeks doing this from scratch, and it's pretty impressive. These are D Department of Justice um, uh, uh, articles about indictments. If you're a company like our company and we're going to try to give you a loan, we're going to say, oh, this is my name's Batu, uh, but, um, Babatunda Taiwo, and I want to get a loan. Well, guess what, Babatunda? We found out that you uh, uh, were indicted for uh, a lot of different things, uh, money, mail fraud, wild fraud. Maybe we won't give you the loan. So it's very, very interesting to pick this up. But the problem with these, with these articles, we have to identify Babatunde. Where does he live? What's the gender uh, of this person? And they're, of course, their name. Uh, the problem is, is in these kinds of uh, articles, like they are press releases or articles, the first article is a summation. You're not going to get their name. You get here, as you see in yellow, this St. Louis resident. It's a his role in a Babatunde uh, Taiwo. And he has these... Uh, 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 he was indicted on these uh, conspiracy to do all these things. So we should end up with a Lex ID. That's what we call our ID for every human being. And in our data system, we try to have every human being there. And each one of you in this room has a Lex ID. And we would have Baba Tumi Taiwo is male and from St. Louis. Well, how in the heck do you do that and say you do that with confidence? Well, it turns out that they're both talking about indictment. So you can return an indictment against somebody and here you have an indictment charges somebody with something. You know that, you can put it that together. Again, if you can show the computer is understanding it like we do, I don't have to convince you that the, under the com computer understands what was there. So let's take a look at um, some real code, some real, um, I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty, but this is the VS Code NLP++ language extension you can download today and run. It's got a full English parser. You can see the whole darn thing. This is the one I did for uh, that demo that you just saw for the Department of Justice. Up here, you have the uh, text corpus. It's just like a, a browser for text that you can run things on. The analyzer sequence are simply NLP files, one after another executed. The highlighting the text, if I click on people and it has rules and I'm trying to match, I will see what rules it's matching. Here's some NLP++ code. Over here, you have a dump of the knowledge base of the brain. This is all built from this text. I came up with this. Two weeks time, I did all this. Um, and this is what I'm building. I'm doing bookkeeping like we humans. I said, what do we know for, for humans? We'll talk a little bit about it. And the syntactic tree. We always think, oh, the syntactic tree in linguistics is the noun, verb, phrase, verb, phrase, all that. Well, not really, because if you have a resume, you have columns and you have headings and you have, like even in articles, you have titles. There's a lot more than just syntactic trees and, and NLP++ handles it all. Um, here's a tree. What's really interesting about this is let's look at here. You have a title, the principal deputy assistant attorney general. You have a name, Richard E. Zuckerman. Up here, when we put this together as an agent being a title with a name, human name, up here, you can see on this agent we've already collected. Oh, here's the name. Here's the title of the person. And you see this con. Um, this is a, uh, we need to make this a little bit more, um, how do you say, transparent what that is. But that's basically pointing into the brain now. So as I'm parsing this, I'm building stuff up in, the, in what I call the, the brain of the, 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 the uh, computer program. And um, I'm using that in, in keeping track of what I'm seeing. And here is, here is a part of that. One of it's simply, I always do it. I keep track of what I'm reading. If you notice here, sentence two has nothing interesting, nothing in green. Sentence three has a lot. Sentence four has a lot. Sentence five has Taiwo, 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 Taiwo. That's because when we humans are doing something, if our goal is to pull out just the indictments, we don't read everything. We don't care if it's talking about something else. We skim past and go by it. So NLP++ also does not have to understand everything. Only needs to understand, like humans who are trained to do this, only understand what they're, uh, what they're supposed to do in this case. If you look up, uh, oh, open up that, that's the next slide. Okay, so here, I said to myself, what do we humans do when we read articles? Well, we keep track of people. That's really important. Um, we also keep, tra keep track of names different because a name is Taiwo all by itself, which is a last name and a full name is, is so you can see here you have Taiwo and you have St. Louis resident. You know, these are, I put them in names because I decided there and my algorithm would work well. 
up here are people. What are people? Oh, they have titles, certain titles, uh, because you have names of all kinds of things. And you can see uh, by the end, I have Babatunde, uh, uh, Babatunde Taiwo, that it's a category is an indictment. He's from the city of St. Louis, state Missouri. He's male. And these are the crimes. The uh, computer understood it just like we do. Um, here's some C, uh, uh, NLP++ uh, function. It's the collect an event. You can hand it. The two things it has in there is the brain, which we call concepts, the sentence concept. So I have a concept in, the, in my brain saying, oh, in, in this sentence I have it. For instance, if I come along and say, uh, uh, David, and later the next sentence I say he, I just go back into my brain, into my memory going, oh, where's, where's go backwards and find he. You got to keep it someplace. Again, all in one programming language. This is all NLP++ using the conceptual grammar. So here we're going not only through, the, uh, we have a, a partner in our brain for the sentence that we're looking at. We also have a part in, in our, uh, uh, we have the syntactic tree that we have of the text itself. And then I write a function to go through that and do whatever I want. Okay. Um, here's a, an NLP++ pattern matching. You have some things, underscores are things that are not words. Not but probably the best answer. If you had a word here, it would just be the word itself. You match these things. There's all kinds of ways you can match. It will uh, then put this together as a city. You can afterwards do post things. That is, okay, this is happening in under the root, under paragraphs, under sentences. You can say where you want these things to be matched. And at that point, I'm going to add, I'm going to call function add city, which goes takes the concept from the sentence, hands it to the city and the state. And go do what you want. Put it in the brain. Put it in the place where you need to keep track of it so you can get out the information you want. That's the power. That's the entire power of this language. Here's add city. You can see here's the sentence uh, concept in my brain. Here are these things you can see. I make a concept. I go try to find it in the location. It's not there. Put it there. It's really simple. In fact, we have people who are not programmers using NLP++. Because why? Someone says, why can that be? Everyone is, is an expert in speaking a human language. And so you just start putting text in and start writing some rules and start building stuff and uh, it becomes contagious. It's a lot of fun. Uh, here then you can see the, this, uh, my place. It's a location. I made a place in my brain called locations and I just kept them there, bookkeep them. We do that when we read. We're, we're thinking about all these things. So it's no different than the brain. Uh, uh, that we're working. And then for debugging, we don't have a step in debugger, but if you want to see, did I get the right uh, uh, Reno? Is that really a city? Well, I just put a debug. It's literally one line. You can just spit it out into a text because it's all text. So you can spit it out and say, did I pick those things out? And in fact, uh, you can check on that. So NLP++ now owns a file extension. This is very recent. Uh, we have claimed .NLP. There is no other programming language for NLP++. NLP. Um, if you look at it up at Google, I, I won't tell you what they say because it, it really burns me when they when they list it. But NL, .nlp is an NLP++ file. Uh, .tree tree file is for the trees that you saw. A .kb is a, actually a special uh, format for NLP++ in the conceptual grammar where we can dump it. So if you have a knowledge base and you want to dump it, read it in later. You, we use NLP++ to build knowledge bases to build to use in other NLP++ analyzers. It's a bootstrapping thing. KBB is a display of, of, uh, of uh, KB files and then TXT, TXXT are when we highlight text and you want to click on it to see what, what have I matched. Um, the, it was developed by myself and Omnon Myers, NLP++. This is conceptual grammar. He came up with the conceptual grammar. I did the visual text. We both contributed to the language NLP++. Um, we both were doing AI research um, in research institutions. We met in 1990 in the AI group for McDonnell Douglas, which is aerospace. We then moved to AI group in TRW Space Park in Redondo Beach. We participated in the DARPA message understanding conferences against university institutions that had people decades of work. We came in, I think I worked on it about three months. We came in third place. Uh, that was pretty amazing. But that was the precursor of NLP++. Between us, we have had we have over 60 years of practical experience. Here's the timeline of this. It's a very interesting that HPC systems came about about the same time um, in the turn of the millennium. Uh, it was a tech startup for Amnon, uh, by Amnon's friends and family. He then lured me away from the resume company 
And we then, by 2001, after we probably had about as many as seven or eight employees, some of them with PhDs working on this, we launched right at the right time, perfect timing, the dot-com crash. No one wanted to know about it. Nobody. In fact, there's a little bubble up there that said, and I'm not kidding, I turned on and on and go, it's go it will take 20 years for this industry to catch up to this. And guess what? I was 40 something now, and now I'm 62. It happened. Um, in between, though, we still marketed and tried to get out there, and we had companies. So I'll, I'll tell you about a couple of six, uh, successes. Uh, NLP Cloud, AWS, I tried that in 2013. We had some companies fight on that. It wasn't still happening. I joined Next Lexus Nexus. We went open source. Amnon dissolved the company in, in 2018. And now everything. People are really growing interested in it. HPC systems, universities. Why? Well, as you know, I'm not. I machine learning is absolutely fantastic. I have kind of a not happy relationship with it because people think it solved everything, and it hasn't. And so, one of the things people are discovering, including our company, is that machine learning can do so much, but it can't learn meaning and do extraction the way we're trying to, people want to do it. So it is now becoming rest, recognized that machine learning, when it comes to natural language processing, is insufficient in many uh, tasks. Uh, solutions have to be have, have an accuracy ceiling. And most important is it requires massive numbers of human generated examples and humans don't like it. We had a, have a, had a radiologist in one of the companies, our company purchased, and he turned to me and said, do you think I'm going to sit around all week making examples from machine learning to get it wrong? That's what he said. And not saying that machine learning isn't useful. It absolutely is. Human beings can't go through trillions of texts and give you statistics on that. It's very important. So that's what we, we have found. And then, of course, when you correct the problem, you've got to then ask, if, can you do five more problems kind of like that? And let's hope that you've got them all because when we train the system, it's no. NLP plus plus, you look at it, oh, I'm missing a word. The phrase isn't right. Um, our definition's wrong. We've got a new definition for a word. You can go in, change it in a generalized way, and know you've solved a general problem. That's, that's the big thing. Um, at Relix, we have all these areas. We are the, Relix is the largest publisher on the planet. So when I, when I interviewed uh, my um, nonsense, stay there. They got more text than anybody on the planet. I said, okay, I'll do that. And I think we can also become the NLP uh, uh, leaders in the world if we really embrace this new technology, 20 year old new technology. And basically unstructured data, digital human readings in, into the HPC systems database, generating new uh, business. So in the validation, a team from NASDAQ flew out from the UK to see Amnon and I on some little beach in Laguna Beach and asked us, how come your system can't, we can't break it technically or we can't break it conceptually? What did you guys create? This was back in 2004. Next thing we knew in the next years, it was running cement, uh, uh, sentiment analysis on tweets and other uh, social media for their major companies. And it was going quite well. And we, they had looked at 100 NLP solutions at that time, and we were the last ones. And that was a big vindication of what we were doing. Of course, politics and, and all kinds of things break things up, has nothing to do with the technology. At iSearch was resume processing. Uh, I was hired to do, to go from, look at a regex, oh my gosh. I'll talk about that at the end, but regex and go to uh, making a more rule based. That was a precursor to the NLP plus plus company. I went over to Amnon, who lured me over. And we did the NLP plus plus county clerk is doing some of the real estate stuff that is right now. Core logic makes $3 billion a year. They got human readers in Barbados, India, and the Philippines reading stuff. We got our little program running and doing this. It's just uh, looking them over. And now universities are, are, are really wanting to take a look. Validation in the company. I, in 2015, I demoed this to David Bayless, whose IQ is enormously high. He's one of, he's the king, he came up with the supercomputing language. In fact, the four people on the original team were literally tested on their IQs before they got in. These guys are brilliant, amazing people. He saw the technology and really saw, wow. And that was back in 2015. So that was quite a hard to print. Got to impress that guy. And I uh, used for, uh, I used it for uh, a problem that was impossible. A couple of years ago during during our conference, we had a meeting and they said, we got all this documentation, we got to mark it up. 
uh, to mark only where we want. We want to, uh, it was documentation for the Brazilian contract we have for HPC systems, 1300 files, and we had to go through them and mark where we didn't want to translate them. You ask any person, I asked the guy, he says, where do you tell me blah, 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 blah. He said, no, go program that in one language. And the guy says, it's impossible. And they said, how many hours would you take to do that by hand? 700. And in two days I had, I had solved problem solved with NLP++. Uh, parsing any messy documents. I use NLP++, not for NLP++, NLP, five, six, seven times a year. Uh, I'll talk about that a little later. Uh, I did three proofs of concepts, and DOG arguments from business information and radiology texts. So um, there's a lot of interest. Intelligent programming, then you can do information extraction about people, places, events, sentiment analysis, better next word predictions. Those are, are, are pretty bad. It's almost, almost statistics. Knowledge based generators from uh, text using LP, using from the knowledge base, generate whatever you want. True translation. If you can translate everything into a knowledge base, you can then translate from to that from any language and out of it. This is a dream from translation from the beginning. Problem, know where to go. No NLP++ exists, so they don't know. Now it does. And then we can get our intelligent agents, intelligent robots. These things can happen. Knowledge base, why do you need it? Here are five languages, Spanish, Portuguese, English, Chinese, Nepali. And I hope, I'm sure, I'm not just going to check my Nepali now. But uh, basically, it says appendix. Uh, there's an appendix that has a wall thickness of four millimeters. You can then go into NLP++. It can have in its brain already sitting there the nominal uh, attributes of all the organs of the body. It can then compare it and say, oh, guess what? You got a problem there. It gives you an example why uh, knowledge, base, knowledge is important. Why can't we talk to Siri and have a conversation? Mostly because we don't have a programming language can do that easily. We don't have people thinking about while you parse language, you build knowledge, you keep that knowledge around, and you use that knowledge. Honestly, I'm going to say something terrible, but this isn't a hard problem for NLP++. I mean, this is not hard at all because these sentences are short. You can, I, I can say an intern project could make an intelligent uh, uh, agent where you would just say, hey, Siri, um, uh, my, my, uh, my, my cousin, uh, I have a cousin named Sam. His birthday is on January 7th. Um, uh, he was born in this this year, and then you could have these conversations because it's just like the sentences you saw. If you speak to it, it keeps it in, in its brain. Where are you going to do that in the programming language on your app, Apple uh, Apple computer? What they are trying to do now is use machine learning all over the place. They don't have a way to program it all into one program, and so that's why I think this is a paradigm shift in programming. So yeah, I, I do call this a paradigm shift in programming. Um, we have basically, look at the, uh, right here in the middle, you have text, you have text structure. Again, it's not just the trees of sentence. You have almost every one of the Python put together, glommed together programs has a text zoner or a, yeah, a zoner that tells you where the text is. And of course you have knowledge. Here's a, some world knowledge of the human body. You have dictionary uh, knowledge, and those are all things you need to know to, to write intelligent programs. What do we have now? If you Google what's the best programming language to use for NLP, it comes up with NLP++, right? No, no. It comes up with Python. And I couldn't figure out, well, that's the, because Python's really good at putting lots of pieces together and using them. So it's basically op opaque siloed packages, like you have a part of speech tagger from Stanford, and you have the new, uh, no, but you, you have, oh, you have ontology, you have the text zoner, you have machine learning, deep learning, um, you have um, uh, you have uh, the text zone. I said that no standard uh, for the KB or the the knowledge base. There's no custom syntactic tree. Uh, you have to either try to build that on your own. There's no live knowledge that you're building. There's no real intercommunicating between them. You can try to do it. If you come over to NLP plus plus, it's all in one language, all in one place. You've got the syntactic the syntactic parse. Um, you have the KB for the parse text you're parsing. You have linguistic and world knowledge. It's all one place. It's a paradigm shift, it really is. So anybody in here agree with the statements they hate regex? That is probably the worst language ever. You can imagine going to a job where you have a resume processor written by someone else, all written in regex. 
And I remember call, I had this one regex about this law. I called up the guy who wrote it. I go, what does this mean? And I sent it to him. He goes, I'm not sure. And regex, regex is just basically trying to do pattern matching, more sophisticated. If you hate regex, you should have this. Every programmer in here should know this language because there is always the time that you're going to come across impossible or messy text files where you know you have data you need to get at and you, you can't get at it easily. It's a no-brainer. I just turn it on, get an NLP++, and I do it. I do it all the time. It's like second nature. Um, there's an NLP.exe NLP engine that runs. You have an analyzer in a place. It's in a folder. It's got all kinds of stuff it needs to keep in that folder because it's intelligent. It's got KB files, all kinds of stuff. It's got the, the NLP++ files, but you can run it on all three platforms. It's also, the engine is written in C++, and we actually have, if you take it, if you download the engine from GitHub, you compile it, it will compile. You can actually, com we have an example of compiling it into another C++ program and calling it. So it's all there. So programming intelligence, we can now write programs uh, with, uh, write intelligent programs. Programs can be built using knowledge and human logic instead of statistics and human generating examples. These programs can bootstrap themselves by building knowledge that they, they can use to understanding new text. One of our goals is to build some analyzers that just read through Wiktionary and build knowledge from it. That's it. And then we can use that. It's a real fun project. Hasn't been done yet. I'm sure um, Amy's writing these projects down. <laughs> more funding, more funding. Um, this is a, a paradigm shift, in my opinion, in, in computer science. And we can finally get to, to uh, those computers that truly understand humans and interact intelligently with them. So what's our immediate plans? Well, I plan to start with this new technology, uh, NLP Center of Excellence at uh, LexisNexis, to use NLP++ plus plus to generate new revenue. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there to eventually maintain and enhance the open source technology. Right now, my friend and I are, have the, are the gatekeepers to this language. I really believe in the future, every programmer will know it. It's going to have to be upkeep and keep building. It's up there already for people to download and enhance. Put your issues in, uh, help out. Uh, then I also have the global initiative in NLP is to create a complete and standardized dictionary for the human language. There's no reason today we don't, we should not have every word of every language and every meaning in the computer and have it available for us. The problem is we've not had the glue to do that. Again, you can use C++, you can use Python. We have the glue now. Knowledge bases for all of these things, medical, legal, government, parsers for all the major languages, including Nepali. Um, <laughs> inside joke with an intern here. Uh, parsers, uh, uh, parsers to read text and generate knowledge bases, parsers for more specific things, such as addresses, temporal phrases, measurements, all that kind of, and visualizations for text corpora, which one of our students uh, here uh, has, has inspired. So um, the ultimate goal is to have NLP++ in, as all, in, uh, all, all programs have in their toolkit, to create computer programs that use and understand language like humans, like HAL in 2001, C3PO in 2000 in Star Wars, Number five short circuit, true digital system. Don't wouldn't you want that digital system to be a digital system so it reminds you of things, knows who you are, knows everything going on? Why don't we have that? We don't have a programming like we have nowhere to go. Now we do. Uh, we're at the beginning of this revolution. Those people who, in my opinion, get on this train are going to be very it's going to be very beneficial in the future. And uh, now we, we, ha we do have a ways to go. This is not going to be overnight. This is, a, this is going to be a decade long or more process, but we know how we can get there. Thank you very much. I hope you have some time for any questions. So, um, part of my understanding here is that your global initiative is building a knowledge base of sorts, but does NLP plus plus have an existing kind of general knowledge base and how is it kind of preempting the problem where when it gets too big and everything just becomes slush that can all be returned for a common set? That's good good question. First of all, we do have a full English parser. And that does it has zero semantics, none. In fact, two of the interns here at Clemson with, with uh, Amy, we went through the process of taking that parser 
and then it just fails on things, stupid things like 3.5 centimeters, right? But you can go in there. The difference between this and the Stanford package is you have everything there. So on the syntactic side, we have that. On the knowledge base, we don't have that so much. The problem has been is people want instant gratification. This is not going to happen with this. I know this has been a hard, I know this is not an easy sell for even my company because I got to go in and say, yeah, we know what we need to do. Now we have the tool to do it. But some of the questions you're asking are very, very relevant. But most of the time, what we're going to find, this is my guess, okay? My guess is the way it's going to work. So we're going to have knowledge base for everything. We should have all the knowledge base for the human body. Eventually, in my opinion, this is going to be able to make it so we'll create a knowledge base for the human body. We don't need anything else. It's all there. I mean, none of, I don't think there's anybody in this room who can imagine that computers should be able to handle that. It's just we haven't had a way to, we haven't had a standardization. When you do that, when you are parsing things, the amount of words, even in a technical domain, is very small. So what happens is you will have the beginning, and my guess is a parser that can almost read anything. It's going to look at it and says, oh, I'm going to use this part of the brain. I don't need all this other stuff. And that's, that's, part, that's what's going to happen, is as you do it, you're only going to need those things in the brain. Yes, it's going to cause a problem if you think you want to have everything there. But I think what's going to really happen is you're going to have, just like, I asked a radiologist, what do you do when you see that? He goes, I look, I, I, I skim through it. That means they're not reading it. And I see what kind of, where are we in the body? What are we talking about? And at that point, then you can go and just point to it. Who cares if it's on disk somewhere, right? You just go get it and put that into memory and then you start using it. Well, that's a good question. And unfortunately, I wish, wish we hadn't, we were started this 20 years ago, but then we wouldn't have all you guys. So, I mean, that, that was, yes, sir. Right, right, right. Here's the answer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was asking you, he's saying that the security, about security, the phishing is obvious, an obvious example of looking what is phishing and what isn't. And you're saying looking at logs, seeing if you can see things in logs, which, which would be uh, important. Really easy answer. When you program in regular programming, you think like a computer. What that answer to that is, I would sit down with a person who is an expert at reading logs, and I'd pick their brain and said, I hope you don't do this for a job because I'm going to write a program to, to, to do what you're doing. And what's fascinating about language and computers is you, to understand language, you've got to understand the way people think. And it really is the biggest downfall in the people learning NLP++ because they want to get into the code. But what you need to do is sit down and interview that person and say, what, how is that person doing it? And what, what's great about that is you can encode that. You don't have to sit there and worry about how do I break it down? How do I do this? You know, and not only that, you are a human being that can generalize. You don't have that problem of training. You're, gonna, you're not going to come up with, even yourself, if you sat down and interviewed or you are an ex expert, you start to write down what you do as a human. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to do it this way, knowing it's going to fail all these other ways. No. We humans have this ability and want to do it in a generalized way. So that's the way I would see it. And that's actually fascinating uh, idea to do. And yes, it could be done, I, I, I believe. If a human can do it, then you can program it on P++. More questions? Anybody okay, online? Uh, some, some questions uh, online. So, uh, Neil asks, does latest uh, speech recognition utilizes the same NLP? Oh, does speech recognition use this, this technology? Is that what the question is? Yeah, he or she Okay, how does how do they deal with the speech recognition right now? They will they will use some syntax, but it's mostly done where you have a lot of training. You have to think they can do a lot of machine learning because you have a lot of text, you have a lot of way, you have ways to read it. You can even generate human voices to read stuff so that in with the text. So they have like AlphaGo. It has its own, you don't have to train AlphaGo. It, 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 you know what the rules are. So what they do is they use a lot of the machine learning on that, and then they will bring in syntax and other things as they go. And then they actually fail two things on your phone. 
If you say something that they go, oh, is there something close on your phone that you're talking about? Maybe your name. You'll see it. If you ever watch, watch it. It'll correct itself. So uh, there's nothing like this, but speech recognition is one of those things that neural networks is, is really great because you're going from sound to the word. When you get to what it means and what you want to do with this whole number story. So uh, Alex asked about the Okay, yeah, the question is, is how generalizable are these things? And the answer is how generalizable you want it to be. Um, but what happens is English is English, for instance, whatever like French is French, Spanish is Spanish, etc. What we do normally is as we do it, there are some things that are going to be specific to a language, a human language, and there are going to be some things that are specific for certain topics, but it isn't that hard. What you really do in topics are your vocabulary. The thing that changes in topics are, is the vocabulary, perhaps the structure. So the answer is you can make it more generic, yes. And with time, the idea, the ultimate would be just like we would have a speech API we have, we throw in and we say, let the person speak and have the text appear. We will have something that says, give it the English and it will come out with structured data of what's in there. That's the ultimate goal. It shouldn't be any different. I mean, it sounds... When we were talking about the speech, you know, 30 years ago, the people had laughed at you. Now it's common. The same thing here, but we can't get to that place. Yes. Okay. So another question is, uh, is reinforcement learning a good tool for NLP? Okay. Yeah, that's a machine learning concept, which is not, uh, it is an interesting question in the sense of how do you test it? How do you know it's doing bad? It's real easy. We humans, when we write code, can easily think about how we can say that it didn't do well. If we have a, uh, if we can go in there and we say there's an indictment word in there and our, our indictment processor doesn't come with an indictment, we spit it out. So in our NLP++ code, we write confidence. We even actually, uh, I'm not came up with a new confidence mathematical uh, function. And we also write in things that say, these things aren't good, spit them out. So we, as we are running, we use our own human brain to say, as I'm processing, what are the things that will give me an alarm that this went wrong? And then you take that, you analyze it, and then you make a generalized solution to it. Um, so, and you can even do it with vocabulary. If you have a vocabulary, you can add vocabulary, et cetera. So uh, that's an interesting question. It's, it's really a machine learning that doesn't apply here but the idea of you know, training or, or doing things. The other thing too, we need a lot less to train, to train, to work on. Because we humans can take 20 texts and do an analyzer that's very good on those because we can generalize. At that point, it's more of vocabulary uh, than anything at that point. So somebody raised the hand. Okay, so I guess uh, uh, Rachel. Thanks. Uh, yes, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I enjoyed also your last slide or two where you mentioned uh, uh, challenges in visualization going forward, both from an industry and perhaps a societal standpoint. Do you have any aspirations over the next five to 10 years uh, for particular points of pain and opportunity, uh, whether as classes or instances on the visualization side that, that, that you could elaborate on? Um, when you talk about visualization side, can you give me a little bit more specific on that? I thought two slides ago uh, with sort of next steps, your last point had uh, related to visualization of uh, one. Oh one yeah, right here, more. right here. Okay. Exactly. I wondered yeah. if you could say more there about some of your aspirations. Yeah, actually it came from one of the students here. Um, uh, he he uh, is working with us on the radiology stuff and he was looking at corpora and he put all this great visualization stuff, which I know exists. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, you could really learn a lot from just looking at a corpus of text by, by, by these kinds of visualizations. So it's more on that side than I'm thinking that, that we see. The other thing is too, is that I think the visualization part, um, this is not really kind of parallel, sort of perpendicular to what you're talking about. Visual text, without that visual text of seeing trees, without seeing the knowledge base, without organizing knowledge, 
one of the things you were talking about, uh, the, the knowledge, one of the questions in the beginning was how it gets all tangled. Well, we really kind of untangle it ourselves to understand it. Because if I'm sure if we went into our brain and could really see what's going on, we would go, we would be horrified. So what we do in our brains is like, I'm going to keep this over here. I'm going to keep both this over in here. And I'm going to keep this over here. And that kind of having a visual, uh, I always find the people who do best in visual uh, uh, writing intelligent programs are visual. And so to answer your question, I'm not really sure, but it's certainly tickled my brain thinking, I bet there's going to be things that I don't even know right now that could be pretty amazing in our ability to have intelligence. I think oh, one coming to my head now, um, one of the problems is, is when we use machine learning for visual, visual stuff, uh, classification, smiles and all that, giving, oh, here's a good example, Tesla. Tesla has not come out with a car for driving because they have literally, they had 200 people. All they did all day was sit at a terminal and write and put on the visualization, putting clicks on where the end, edges of the road were. That's all they did. In fact, they were just fired. I think they made a big mistake. <laughs> they fired them all just recently. And, and what I'm thinking is that even though we're working with text, NLP and the whole philosophy, this change in philosophy of doing it like humans, that we can go back. I think you probably remember, Amy, when the first visual stuff, they were literally trying to take features out and use logic to figure out what was going on. They didn't just throw a neural network at and say, tell me if this is a muffin or a, 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 a chihuahua. So I think in that side, it may in fact come back at us in that direction. That's kind of really out there. Good question though. Thank you. All right. So, any other questions? No. Okay. So, I think that's our time. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again. All right. Did it record? Yeah. I don't have to do it again. Right, if you have any questions, you can contact me. Um, I will be around. I can be outside if you have any, uh, I, uh, whatever, discuss it. Um, but I really do want to